God is the author of authority. And if we want to experience the power of our identity in Christ, then we have to learn to be obedient to the authority God has placed over us. Authority, identity, and power. That's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. I trust you've really enjoyed the teaching so far, several weeks now, on authority, identity, and power. And as I said yesterday, as we close the program, today we're going to go back to Ephesians, and we're going to look at chapter 5, and we're going to continue reading about delegated authority in the family. Yesterday I explained delegated authority in government, and today we want to look at delegated authority in the family. And I hope it'll help some of you, some of you uh, husbands, wives, in your marriage, in your family. Um, And let me make these statements. Obedience to delegated authority always brings blessing. Disobedience to delegated authority always brings cursing, uh, retribution, reprimand, etc., So rebellion produces loss of power. If you want the power of God in your life, you can't rebel against authority. We have examples of that in the Bible. Now, as we begin reading again in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 22, let me make this statement. The husband is the delegated authority of Christ. Um, The wife represents the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read it. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. The key in understanding this verse is you submit yourself to your husband as you would the Lord. Not if he's like the Lord. I know wives say, well, yeah, I'd be happy to sub- submit myself, yield myself to my husband. If he was like the Lord, that's not what it says. It says, as you would the Lord. How would you submit yourself to the Lord? Now, remember, he's talking about delegated authority. He's not talking about control, abuse. (laughs) I remember one time, Brother Copeland was in our church, and this lady came up, and she'd been abused. And he came up in front of her, and she was just teared up and crying and sobbing and weeping. He said, "And, and what's your problem? She said, My husband's beat me up 42 times. And he looked at her and he said, Ma'am, the first 41 were his fault and the next one was your fault. Don't stand there and get beat on. Get out so that you're not abused like that. A lot of times we suffer under abuse because we don't understand our delegated authority. You ought to get Jeannie's teaching on how to make a marriage work. She's taught it on VTN, on her program, In His Presence. You can go online, vtntv.com, and you can uh, uh, pull it up and watch it on demand. Uh, How to make your marriage work. Because she, and she writes this in her book, Learning How to Trust God's Faithfulness. She had to learn this. I didn't know it at the time, but she tells it later. She said, when we started going to a Friday night Bible study after I got saved and we started studying on the family and she and they read these scriptures to her, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. She said, this submission stuff is <laughs> it's not right. She said, I'm not going to do that. And she, we had a, a book we were reading and she threw the book across the room, said, this is, this is ridiculous. But then the Holy Spirit began to teach her and show her why following delegated authority in the scriptures is so important. And she got it and she taught it to other uh, wives. Notice that it says, you submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. Why? That husband is the delegated authority in that family. Now, if the husband is not doing his due diligence, if he's not fulfilling his proper role in the proper way in the family. And most husbands don't because they don't know how. They haven't been taught. They have been trained in the world, uh, the caveman mentality, the Marlboro man, the John Wayne syndrome. They've been trained that way. And that's not the Bible way. 
That's not who Jesus was. It says you submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord, as you would if Jesus were your husband. Now that makes a difference. So why is he telling the wife to do this? The husband is the delegated authority. Now I know it'll take some doing for some of you. <laughs> your husband's pretty rough around the edges and you'll think, ah, oh, how am I going to do this? He's nothing like the Lord. Well, you have to submit yourself unto him as you would the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about subjection to abuse. I'm not talking about being a doormat. Neither is the scripture. But we've got to get this revelation of delegated uh, authority. So the husband, now husbands, are you listening? The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, are you ready? Are you sitting down? Listen to this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ah, now this comes in total contrast to what the world teaches about um, marriage relationships. Most husbands, this just, this just goes right over their head. <laughs> Are you telling me that I am to give myself for my wife? Yes, that's what the Bible says. Well, I thought she's supposed to give herself for me. I thought she's supposed to take care of the kids, raise the kids, change the diapers, clean the house, cook the meals, wash the clothes. <laughs> now you're, no, you're talking about a servant. You're talking about a slave. That's not your wife. Husbands, it is your job, according to the scriptures. I know husbands don't like to hear this, but if you'll listen, it'll bring forth a revelation to you. Husbands, it is your job to give yourself for your wife, not the other way around. Now, you won't see that in the John Wayne movies. <laughs> you, won't, you won't see that portrayed out in the culture, but it's in the Bible. What does that mean, Pastor Caldwell? Give myself for my wife. I thought she's supposed to submit to me as if she was submitting to the Lord. The Bible says the Lord gave himself for the church. The wife represents the church. The husband represents the Lord. And the Lord gave himself for the church. Therefore, the church has no problem in submitting itself to the Lord because the Lord gave himself for the church. Husbands, if you're going to be like, let's follow the biblical model. If you're going to be like the Lord, you have to give yourself for your wife. What does that mean? What does that look like? It means that you are there to fulfill her every need her every desire, her every effort. You're to not only provide for her, take care of her, nurture her, love her, but everything that she desires or needs, you are to supply it. Now, that doesn't mean, wives, that, you're, that you depend totally on your husband. You, you have a relationship with the Lord yourself. You go directly to the Lord. He'll meet all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But your husband is to be like the Lord. He's the delegated authority in the family. Now, husbands and wives, when the children see this, they're learning by experience. You're providing a model for them to go on to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. I, I want and observed. I look back on my family, my mother and father. I never, ever saw my father abuse my mother. I never saw him talk down to her. I never saw him uh, uh, physically uh, abuse her, hit her, n nothing like that. No, no, no abuse in our family whatsoever. My father did everything he could to be a blessing to my mother. And I observed that. I watched that. <laughs> I'll tell you some funny stories. I've, I've told them before, but maybe you didn't hear them. When Jeannie and I got married in our first anniversary, uh, Christmas anniversary, those kind of uh, remembrances, I wanted to bless my wife. So 
I got her for, for Christmas one year, I got her a brand new set of pots and pans. <laughs> she was not, she was not excited over it. And the next Christmas or birthday or anniversary, whatever it was, I bought her an exercise. Oh man. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, if she weighed a hundred pounds, she she you know she didn't need an extra cycle. She didn't need any pots and pans. She didn't want any pots and pans or an extra cycle. And my father pulled me aside and said, son, <laughs> he saw the frustration. He said, son, you, you do not buy your wife pots and pans and an extra cycle. Do you understand? I said, well, no, I, I was just trying to bless her. He said, no, no, that does not bless a woman. I said, well, what should I get her? He said, jewelry. That blesses her. <laughs> clothes that blesses her. You bless her with what she wants, what she desires. So I immediately changed. And I mean to tell you, it made a big difference in the marriage. I've never done anything like that since. I always buy her what she wants. I'll see her watching, looking through catalogs and she'll say, oh, I really like that. That's pretty. I said, let me see it. I'll make a mental note. I'm going to go to the store and get that for her. Not only that, not only the material things, but what, what is your wife desiring to accomplish? Uh, does she want to be um, uh, better educated? Does she want to go back to school? Uh, has she been asked to speak? Does she want to serve in some capacity in the church? The husband's job is to encourage her, to pray for her. If she's facing anything, situation, I remember one time my wife was criticized and slandered and judged by some people in the church. Not, not our church, but a, a previous friends that she had. And she was really hurt by it and offended. And my wife's always been a fighter. I mean, she was, uh, her daddy didn't have um, boys. He had three girls. So she was the tomboy and she was uh, with her daddy. I mean, she loved her daddy and she was a uh, you know, she wasn't above uh, uh, fighting some girl at the school or whatever. She was a, she was a, uh, um, I, I, I say she had fortitude. And so uh, when these people offended her and lied about her and slandered her and whatever, boy, she was going to give them a piece of her mind. And I said, honey, don't do it. I said, let's pray. And I ministered to her and prayed for her to, for her to, forgive them. I said, you can't afford to allow this offense to stay there. What am I doing? I'm standing in the gap for her. I'm acting as the Lord would for her, her helper, her defense. So husbands, you're to love your, your wife and give yourself for her as the Lord does the church. The Lord is the protector, the provider I remember there were times where my wife uh, wanted certain things and we didn't have the money to, to buy them. And the Lord would show, I said, Lord, I want to be the one to give her this. Help me do this. Show me how to do this. And he showed me. He said, you've got this and that and that. He said, you can sell it and you'll have the money to buy that for. So I did it. I remember it, a lot of young married couples have this problem. Uh, we both worked. Now, this was before I got saved. We both worked. She was a professional. Uh, she was the administrative assistant to uh, the president of the Bankers Association. She had a good job, very professional job. And uh, I, I didn't have a good job. I was in the liquor business, but I made uh, a weekly check. She made a, a bi-weekly, uh, bi-monthly check. So we pooled our income. Two, two incomes coming in, and we put it into one account. Now, I'm going to help some of you men right here. Listen, we put it into one account. It was a joint account. Either one of us could, could sign it and draw out of it. But when it came time to spend some money out of our joint bank account, we were supposed to discuss each and every item that we purchased. Now, if it was furniture, if it was something for the house, the family, if it was our son's school, clothes, books, whatever, that, that was understood that we would discuss that. But 
What if she wanted to go spend some money on something? What if I wanted to spend some money on something? We would talk about it. But I found myself not want. I, I don't think I ever told her you can't buy that or you shouldn't buy that. But I found myself feeling that way. And I knew that wasn't right. And I knew that she worked her job just as hard as I did mine. She put her paycheck in there and I put my paycheck in there. And one day, this was, this was after I got saved, after I got born again, this was still bothering me. And the Lord helped me. So I went down and opened a bank account for her. Now, I know I'm going to get myself in trouble here with some of you husbands. And I went down and opened a bank account for her. It was her account. It was in her name. It was her account. And I went home to her one day, and I presented her with her checkbook. And I said, honey, this is your account. Oh, we still have our joint account, and I will put my paycheck in there, and I will pay all the bills out of my paycheck, out of our joint account, but this is your account. It's yours and yours alone. And you can put your check in there every month and you can spend out of that account whatever you want. I paid for the groceries. I paid for the, uh, the house payment at that time. I paid for everything that we needed. I paid for it out of our joint account. I put my check. In. She didn't put her check in our joint account anymore. She put it in her personal account. And it's still that way today. And next year, next year, we'll have been married 50 years. So that blessed her so much. She had her own account, her own money. She worked for it. She made it. She put it in her account. And she could spend it however she wanted to. What was I doing? You say, well, you sure weren't, sub uh, <laughs> you sure weren't making her submit to you. No. I was giving myself for her. I was just like the scripture says. It says, husbands, Christ, uh, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I would defend her. I would stand up for her. I would protect her, provide for her, encourage her. When, we, when I did get saved and we went into the ministry, I encouraged her to share, to teach, she didn't want to teach a lady's Bible study. She didn't think she was qualified. I encouraged her. Still to this day, she's a good teacher. She's written books. She's, you know, all kinds of things. I encouraged her to do this, to do that, to go on television. To, you encourage, you, you provide, you protect. As the Lord does the church. You don't criticize, you don't reprimand, you don't scold, you don't browbeat. Now, this is all delegated authority, but sometimes, husband, you, you think you're such a, you know, a big man, hotshot man, blah, blah, blah. But you, can't, you cannot even act as the Lord. You can't even act, <coughs> excuse me, towards your wife as the Lord does the church. Now, all of this has to work together. Delegated authority only works. There's only power when each person that has been given delegated authority assumes that authority. Now, some of you husbands, you need to repent right now. You need to repent, ask God to forgive you for trying to be the Lord over the uh, wife or the children, the household. Let, let me give you another example. Go over to Ephesians 6. And look at verse 1. Now, I used to read this to my son, and I used to make him read it all the time. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> Especially when he'd miss it, I'd make him go read this. You know, it's tough growing up being a preacher's kid. Because everybody expects things from you that they don't expect from anybody else just because you're father's a pastor or a preacher. Uh, I said, son, go read this again. Uh, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you. You may live long on the earth. 
Oh man, he knew that coming and going. He knew that backwards and forwards. I'm the delegated authority in this family. And I am requiring of him to be obedient to that authority. What I was neglecting was the next verse. And he called my attention to this one day. I mean, he was probably in high school. He was probably a young teenager, maybe junior high, high school. And he came walking down the hall one day. He said, Dad, he said, you know that scripture that you always have me read, children obey your parents in the Lord? I said, yes. He said, Dad, have you ever read the rest of that scripture? <laughs> I said, well, I'm sure I have. What are you referring to? He said, well, let me read it to you. Now, he did this in all due respect. He said, it says, and fathers provoke not your children to wrath. He said, dad, you're provoking me to wrath. <laughs> I almost laughed, but I caught it because I knew he was right. And I repented and apologized to him. Everybody in the family, everybody in the government, everybody in the culture has to take their proper place in delegated authority or else there's no power. And this is why the family, this is why marriages don't work. This is why the family doesn't work. And this is why the culture's messed up. If you can, I, I, I get so grieved, I guess better than frustrated, um, when I hear organizations and uh, attempts uh, to correct what's wrong in the culture, correct what's wrong in society, and they have all these programs and these groups and whatever. If we would just correct the family, everything else would be corrected. If you just correct the family, if you'd correct the husband, if you'd correct the wife, the delegated authority, the children. I really feel uh, sorry for children growing up in today's culture because they're, they're, there's so many demands on them, uh, demands on them, uh, their honor, their lifestyle, their uh, whatever that we didn't have when we were kids growing up. I mean, we didn't have to define what marriage was. We didn't have to figure out what sex we were. We didn't, we didn't have to deal with all these social media uh, pressures. Uh, we didn't have to understand uh, what relevance means. Uh, we didn't have to uh, understand what uh, a lie is. <laughs> we, uh, we, we were taught. We knew. We knew American history. We knew uh, the, to honor the flag. Uh, we knew what respect authority meant. My father saw to that. He, if he, he said, if I ever catch you uh, smart talking your mother, back talking your mother, arguing with your mother, rebelling against your mother, said, you and I are going to have a meeting. That meant a spanking. So he taught me and he enforced it. He would not allow it. And he would always tell me that you must obey the laws of the land, the police. In fact, I found out um, a year or two after I started driving at 16 and, and my dad, I, I didn't know this for several years, but my dad knew some policemen personally. And he went to these policemen and he told them, he said, now my son is so-and-so and he is starting to drive and here's the kind of car he drives. And uh, if you ever see him speeding, breaking the law, doing anything that is uh, against the law, come tell me. I didn't know that for years, but he had, he had the police officers in our town, uh, which at that time was Pine Bluff. He had the police officers in that town inform him if I was doing anything illegal or immoral or breaking the law. I tell you what, it, it was almost like I, I, couldn't, I couldn't misbehave. I couldn't uh, do anything that was immoral or illegal without my parents knowing about it. And if I did, there were consequences to pay. What were they doing? They were reinforcing this authority. They instilled in me. Consequently, when I graduated high school and went off to college, when I went, left college and went in the military and went to boot camp, I understood authority 
My father saw to that. He would not allow any rebellion against authority. He told me one time, he said, if you'll always tell the truth, I won't give you a whipping. He said, but if you lie to me, I'm going to give you a whipping. And one time in those, this, this was, this was, I think probably grade school. And uh, I lived over on South Martin street here in Little Rock. And we had a club in the sewer. I know it sounds weird, but you could take the manhole cover off and go down into the sewer, you know, to a 12, 13 year old boy. This is huge. We went down into the sewer and we would go down there and smoke cigarettes that we had found in the gutter. It's stupid, I know. And we'd smoke these cigarettes. And of course, the, the smoke would come out the, the, the gutter, the drain. And my sister was walking by one day. And we popped the manhole cover and came out and she just looked at me and saw us coming out of there. She said, Bubba, I'm going to go tell daddy on you. And so she did. She went and told daddy in those days, there was no air conditioning and he was sitting on the front porch and he, he said, come here and sit down beside me. Well, son, I said, okay. He said, you've been smoking? No, sir. Absolutely not. He bent me over his knee and gave me a spanking. And he said, now I didn't spank, spank you for smoking. I spanked you for lying. And in my lightning fast mind, I thought, oh, okay. Huh. Uh, I can't lie, but it's okay to smoke. That was a <laughs> wrong assumption. But that was how my little mind processed that. He made sure that I understood that lying was not acceptable. Neither was smoking. He, he wasn't promoting that. But he's saying, I'm, I'm going to spank you for lying because you're disrespecting delegated authority. But today, you know, we don't have that. Everything's relevant. It's okay to lie if it benefits your cause or prevents you from getting in trouble or whatever. And that's, that's what's happened to the culture. So we've got to get back to delegated authority. We've got to see and understand that this is for our good. Romans 13. Okay. Uh, here's some points that I made. I think it'll help you. The husband is the delegated authority. He's the delegated authority of Christ. It's difficult for a wife if she doesn't understand this revelation. Now, we'll pick this up here tomorrow. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.